thank you for this time. We thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you because of the unbreakable covenant you have made with us. That if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, heaven will be ours at last. That you have gone to prepare a place for us. When you come, you are coming back. And the sky is our goal, not the grave. And we know that when you come, by your grace, by your power, by your love, by your spirit, will be ready, looking for you, waiting for you. Lord, we're asking for that day, get us ready. Amen. And we also pray that as many people as possible in our churches and from outside our churches, you'll grant us the grace and the enablement to do our part. Get them ready for that coming of the Lord. Amen. Use us, Lord, in the lives of other people. Amen. Let, O oh Lord, your work prosper in our hands. Amen. Move upon us. Amen. Move within us. Amen. Move through us in the lives of other people. Amen. Lord, as we get into another session now, bless us all together. Amen. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now you can relax because I'm the one that is taking this session. The other sessions, they had so much to say that you needed to write and write and write. You know, sometimes um, when you are a generous representative and you have all these pastors under you and they come and they teach, and they teach from Genesis to Revelation, you wonder what you are going to teach when you now come there. <laughs> but uh, we thank God for the people that have been teaching and you had a lot to write. Now the things I have to share with you, you may not be able to write a lot, Listen, somebody who is pregnant, going to the prenatal care, you know what we call prenatal care, and uh, they're teaching them now, when you want to deliver a child, you have some pains, and there are stages of the pain, and this woman pregnant, she's busy writing down notes, then you'll feel like this, and don't cry, don't weep, don't roll on the ground, just get steady, it happens to everybody. Others before you, they, you know, got their children, and it's something you can bear. 15-year-old uh, ladies, they have got uh, children, they went through the pain. It's not, uh, you know, all that serious, although it's painful. And she's busy jotting down notes of what the nurse was saying. Then the labor pain came, and she began to cry. And uh, the midwife said, remember what you wrote in your note? <laughs> oh, and she said, this one is not a note matter. <laughs> now, what I came here for this afternoon is not note matter. It is real material for us to digest, for us to understand. If you are able to write, all right. If you are not able to write, it's not note matter. Do we understand? Yes. Because I'm talking on the shepherd's ministry. And that is the real thing that we need to understand. The ministry of the shepherd. When we talk about a shepherd, we're talking about a pastor. Or we're talking about an overseer. A person that has the pastoral care, the shepherd care over maybe even other pastors and teachers. Or perhaps we're talking about a superintendent who has the care and the watchful ministry over other people. And of course, he may be an apostle. An apostle is also having a shepherd ministry. Or in a general sense, he is a leader. So in a way, whatever we're doing, whether we're pastors or we're overseers, 
or were superintendents or were apostles or leaders in the general sense in the work of God, you have a shepherd ministry. And there is a great need in the church for shepherds. Not just ordinary shepherds. There are different types of shepherds. But there is a cry, a great need. In the hearts of many people in many churches that they need shepherds with shepherd hearts. There are some shepherds in appearance, in clothing, in position, in office, who are not shepherds in their heart. In fact, Jesus talked of the people that will have sheep's clothing, but at heart they are wolves. And you also have people that may be shepherds in appearance or in title, but in their hearts they are not really shepherds. Jesus said they are hirelings, employed people, who are just supposed to take the money because of the professional thing they are doing. But the cry in our churches, the need in our churches, is for shepherds with shepherds' hearts, shepherds' vision. Think about a shepherd that doesn't know where to get the grass that is green for the sheep. Think about a shepherd that doesn't know where to find water in a desert land for the sheep. Now the shepherd must have the shepherd's vision. Without that vision, the sheep will perish. The people will perish. Shepherd's knowledge. Think about it. A shepherd, when he says he's a shepherd, like all these cattle rearers that we see, going from one part of the country to the other, leading their cattle, they need to understand a lot about the cattle, about the sheep and about the lifestyle, about the thing that will be inconveniencing to them, about the things that will kill them, destroy them, and about contagious diseases they could get in and will just kill the whole lot of the sheep. The shepherd needs, we need shepherds in our churches that have the shepherd's heart, the shepherd's vision, the shepherd's knowledge, shepherd's resourcefulness. Resourcefulness in the sense that he knows how to meet the needs in the congregation. He knows how to meet the demands of the various categories of people. In our churches, there will be women, there will be men, there will be teenagers, there will be adults, there will be illiterate, there will be educated people, there will be university students, there will be trade, uh, there will be traders, there will be market women, resourcefulness, a minister, a pastor, a shepherd that is able to meet the needs and the demands of all these categories of people, that every one of those people in the church, they'll be able to say, he's our pastor. We need shepherds that will be able to stand to the responsibility that the Yoruba people in the church, the Igbo people in the church, the Epic people in the church, the Alsa people in the church, in the whole church, they all know that this pastor or shepherd is so resourceful that he always brings out the needs of the people and it doesn't matter from what part of the country you are coming from and you are part of that church, it's resourceful enough to take care of them. Those are the shepherds we need. The people that will actually make the church grow today. Now, if you have a, a congregation where the uh, old people are there and the young people are there, the old people... Uh, they sing and they're almost sleeping while they're singing. The young people, when they're singing, the house is almost shaking because of their enthusiasm, because of their power, because of their activity. Now when you have the old and the young there, the old people are saying, we have done enough, let us rest. The young people are saying, this is our day of opportunity, let's march on. And you are a shepherd over both of them. You need resourcefulness. And then we need pastors that have the wisdom of the shepherd and, of course, the love of the shepherd. And without all this, the shepherd will not have a ministry. Without having the heart, the vision, the knowledge, the resourcefulness, the wisdom, and the love. Now, reading through the Old Testament, the greatest need in Israel was for a leader that actually could help them to stay in the center of the will of God. Now, when we talk about Israel, 
We're talking about the Jewish people. The beginning of the Jewish people dates back to Abraham. And from the time of Abraham, Israel had always needed a shepherd that will guide them. Now, originally, those leaders or shepherds were called patriarchs. Abraham was a patriarch. Eventually, after Abraham, you had a lot of people that came on, but a significant leader that came in Israel was Moses. He was a great shepherd. How do we know? Shepherd heart. God said, Moses, the people are so, so rebellious and so stubborn and so stiff naked that and they've gone back into sin and idolatry. Leave me alone with them. Let me destroy them. Wipe them out. And I will make out of you another nation. Great nation. And here comes the shepherd with a shepherd heart saying, Oh no, Lord. I do not want to be great at the expense of the destruction of your people. Make them your people. And then when he came back and he saw that they had sinned, Look at the man with the shepherd heart as he said, God, these people have sinned, but if you'll forgive them, well, but if not, block me out of your book that you have written. If you're going to forget them, send them to hell. I can't get to heaven without them. I'll follow them to hell. That's shepherd's heart. And Israel had always had the need of having somebody that needed, that had a shepherd heart. Then came on Joshua. And there was that defeat. And then he went before the Lord. Oh Lord, what will I do? If Israel will turn their backs before their enemy, where will I go? His interest, his concern was for the success and the victory of the people. And he said, I cannot enjoy life. I cannot enjoy my family. I cannot enjoy my great position as a leader in Israel. If the children of Israel, if they are defeated, then I'm in defeat. And God said, stand up, Joshua. There is sin in the camp. Deal with that sin. And he got out Achan. And he said, my son. You see the shepherd? Of course, he was to deal with Achan. But my son, what have you done? Tell me. That's the shepherd. The wisdom, the love, the resourcefulness, the knowledge, the vision, the heart of the shepherd. It has always been a great need in Israel. Have you read in the Old Testament, when there was no king in Israel, then all the Israelites went everyone to his own way. Confusion, conflict, defeat. Lack of progress, lack of, lack of cooperation and coordination when there was no king. And their need was for somebody to lead them. Then came on Saul. But just for a brief time did he have all that a shepherd needed to have until God said, I've been searching and I've found a man after my own heart. You know, God is the great shepherd of Israel. And he said, I've got a man who is a real shepherd. Who is that person? The person that a lion will come to the fold and take a single lamb. Single lamb. Now, a, a hireling will think, I won't die. I can't kill myself. I'm more important than the sheep. The one that has a shepherd heart is not always thinking of, I am more important. I have a better thing to do. I have my family at home. I can't die on this a little congregation. And then went ahead against the lion because of a single lamb. No wonder God said, I found a man after my heart. If he can defend a single animal like that against the lion, he will defend the nation Israel. That's the shepherd. And the great need that we have today is for a shepherd who doesn't care for money doesn't care for anything. All that he wants is that he wants to take care of the people of God. And the greatest need in the church, think about it. I've told you about Israel. That the greatest need that Israel had was for a shepherd with the heart, with the vision, with the knowledge, with the resourcefulness, the wisdom, and the love. And then in the church, the leaders, very, very important. In fact, have you noticed? 
that Jesus Christ spent most of his time with his disciples. Now, he started by holding meetings or having what we call today open air meetings and crusades. And we're told that he went to Galilee. Now, the shepherd, because Jesus Christ himself is a great shepherd. And he went to those places where many, many people were available. He preached to them. And he started coming one by one. The moment they started coming, he started selecting leaders out of them. And he said, follow me. I will make you leaders or fishers of men. The same thing. Leaders of men, fishers of men. And as he got these, he got them nearer to himself. Everywhere he went, he took them. All that he knew, he exposed to them because he, as a shepherd, wanted to raise up the greatest need in the church, shepherds as well. And it took him time. Sometimes he ministers to these people in the public. Then they come back into the house and they will ask him questions. He never said, I am too tired. You should have known that. Shepherd's heart, shepherd's love, shepherd's wisdom. Shepherd's resourcefulness, he was always teaching them, putting everything he had into them. And then came the last few days before he left, and he cancelled every plan for crusade. At the time he was to leave, and he called these people the Passion Week. And he started telling them, I am going, be prepared. Because the scripture says, smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And then he said, Father, all that you have given me, I lost none, except the son of perdition. And then when they came to catch him, he said, who are you looking for? And they said, we're looking for Jesus. He said, I am. And if you're looking for me, let this go. One, the shepherd had that even at the time he was suffering, at the time that he was to die, his love, his care for these people, that care was still there. That's the shepherd had. Apart from that, he knew that they were the people that will carry on the world. And he concentrated on them the last few days he spent on the face of the earth. Not only that. Now, if you were, I know you are not, and you cannot be, except a false Christ, false prophet. You cannot be Jesus Christ. Can you be? Answer me well. Can you be? No. You know, sometimes it's embarrassing when uh, you've been in the primary school and you've gone to primary school and the person you are playing football with, beating one another, and that person will abuse your father, abuse your mother, and then you passed out of primary school. After passing out of primary school, you went to uh, maybe trade before you became a minister, or you went to be a tailor before you became a minister. And then a primary school fellow that you remember that you were in the same school at that time, you came back to town and you heard that that your classmate is now Jesus Christ. <laughs> and he's telling people all over the state, in your state, and he's saying, I am Christ. And you say, who is that? And then you, you, come, you go back home and you say, ah, Abel, what is this? And he says, no, I am Christ. <laughs> You're the one that uh, our teacher in uh, primary four was uh, beating, and I will carry you when the teacher was beating you that day. And you are now Christ. Say, no, no, I am now Christ. <laughs> you know, it's funny. <laughs> and some of these uh, people that are now saying they are Christ or they are Jesus or they are Messiah, their classmates in primary school must be laughing at them. <laughs> so you cannot be Jesus Christ. Can you be Jesus Christ? No. Not at all. Now, suppose you were Jesus, you cannot be supposed to work. <laughs> Is that all right? Yeah. Now, suppose you were and you died. All those, the pilots, Caiaphas, and all those people. Now they said, now he's dead and he will never rise up. And then when they heard that Jesus rose up, now they said it's a lie. Then they told those soldiers, you tell the people that his disciples came and stole him away. And Jesus knew that that was the story they were telling. If you were, what will you do after you rose up from the dead? He'll appear to them. To show them, now you killed me, look at me now. <laughs> but all those 40 days, Jesus stayed with his disciples. Those who were going to carry the story of the resurrection, he stayed with them. 
He trained them. He loved them. He sought for them. He gathered them together as a hen will gather the chicks under. Because of the shepherd heart, his emphasis was on them. Because he knew that they were the people that will carry on the work. That means then, the greatest need even in the church, the New Testament church, was for leaders or shepherds, shepherds that are divinely appointed. Of course, there are self-appointed shepherds. They've never heard from God. They've never known God. They've never seen God. But they appoint themselves. But we're talking about divinely appointed shepherds. Not only that, anointed shepherds. Equipped, consecrated, trustworthy, dependable, and spiritually matured. I told you it's not note matter. You understand? And, um, and I don't want anybody to sleep. Because this is very important for us. You know, I heard of a preacher who was preaching and he saw somebody sleeping. Now look up if you don't want me to look at you. Are you sleeping? You want to hear my story? Okay. This uh, preacher was preaching. He saw somebody sleeping. He said, what should I do to wake this person up? And he said, um, now anybody here that wants to go to hell, Stand up! <laughs> and then, that was sleeping. He didn't hear the, he didn't hear the first part of the sentence. <laughs> And he stood up. Now, when he stood up, <laughs> he looked around. And he didn't, uh, he didn't find any other person standing up. <laughs> so he said, well, I'll stop. <laughs> I don't know why, why I'm standing up. <laughs> But, um, but I see only two of us. Are <laughs> so I think we must be going to the same place. <laughs> Wake now. All right, I did all that to, to wake up those who are sleeping. Now let's come back. Now that you are awake and you are now with me. Are you all with me? Yeah. Now we need shepherds. Shepherds with the heart of shepherds. And these shepherds that are divinely appointed. And they are anointed. And they are equipped. And they are consecrated and trustworthy. And they are dependable and spiritually matured leaders. Now there are four alternatives. For our churches, for our ministries, and for our denominations concerning the shepherds, or the pastors, or the overseers, or the apostles and bishops and the leaders. Number one, there may be no shepherds at all. And there are some churches like that, that you just find that there is no pastor. The church is there, they are carrying on. There may be a board of elders, but there is no pastor, there is no leader, there is no shepherd. Now, those churches where there, is, where there are no leaders, what's the danger? And you must find out. Sometimes, uh, you know, we're busy evangelizing. And we go to a particular village and we evangelize. Many people come to the Lord. But then we don't put a shepherd, a pastor over them. And we just say, well, God has called me to evangelize. We move to another town. We evangelize again. And we say, well, God has just called me to evangelize. And there's no leader there again. And we feel we're working for God. There is no time to train the shepherds, the pastors, and put over those people. And there is no time and there is no wisdom to cooperate with the existing churches in that village or in that town so that you can have a person or you can direct all of them to the churches who are sure about that there will be shepherds that will lead them. 
Now, if there is no shepherd, what is the consequence and the danger upon the congregation and the fellowship? In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36, but when he saw the multitude, the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. That means then, if we're establishing branch churches and we know that we do not have the leaders to put over them, maybe we should slow, slow down. Because if there are no shepherds over them, then there will be a sheep that will be scattered. And then that means there will be no church eventually. And then we're told in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 31. Then says Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Now, brothers and sisters, there are times that in a denomination, um, a pastor has offended, has done something wrong. And we feel that we must discipline that pastor in that town, in the church. And we remove him. But sometimes we as overseers and bishops or general superintendents, maybe we're not wise enough. It's all right, we must discipline whoever is wrong. If it's of enough weight, what he has done. If that thing is of enough weight, that he must be disciplined. I don't think you'll discipline a person because uh, he came to the headquarters church and he didn't come and say yes, sir, before, uh, before he went away. I don't think, you may not like it, but that's not something to discipline somebody for. But maybe he commits adultery or fornication. And you want to discipline that person, then you remove him. You cannot be pastor in this church because of this adultery and fornication. That's right. But you didn't think of putting another pastor there. You just removed him and sent him away. And then you went back to the headquarters, expecting that the church will continue. After all, the church had been there for 10 years. They should know what to do. There's carelessness on our side. We must put a leader there. Because if there is no shepherd, then the sheep will scatter. And if they don't know what has happened to their leader, he is not dead, Nothing is said publicly about what he has done, and he's not allowed to minister, and there is no minister that is placed on that church. They will scatter and go to other churches. And it is the leader himself, it is the bishop or the superintendent or the overseer himself who has scattered the people. Because the shepherd, their pastor was taken away, and there was no leader to replace him. So then that means that we must not allow our branch churches to be uh, churches or groups without any leader at all. In Judges chapter 21 and verse 25. Judges 21 verse 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. No king in Israel. Think about thousands of people. The uh, last minister that ministered to us reminded us that these children of Israel, when they were coming out of Egypt, you had 600,000 men. What does that mean? Take the whole of Port Harcourt and assume that all the children there, all the women there, all the students there, all the adults there, all the aged there, assume they were young people, all of them. Then you have 600,000 men, not counting their wives and their children. And that big, great number of people had no leader, had no king. Even no judge at a particular time. And everyone did what was right in his own eyes. 
Oh, you say it is different today because we have the Bible. No, sir. They also are church. It's sinful. It's corrupt. It's covetous. What happens to that fellowship? In Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel chapter 34. And I'm reading from verse 4. The diseased have ye not strengthened? Neither have ye healed that which was sick. Neither have ye bound up that which was broken. Neither have ye brought again that which was driven away. Neither have ye sought that which was lost. But with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. Now, brothers and sisters, sometimes we have um, superintendents and bishops and overseers. And we think that we are placed pastors and shepherds over the branches, but we don't know what they are doing. And they never visit when the members are sick. They never take care when the members have any problem. All that they expect from their headquarters is for their salary or allowance to be sent to them. And then it says, with cruelty and force, they have ruled the people of God. There is a leader, but then the leader is not worth his name, not worth his soul, not worth his position. And in verse 5, and they, have scat they were scattered. That's the sheep. Because there is no shepherd. What does that say? It says, when the leader is sinful, corrupt, and covetous, it is the same thing as if there were no leader at all. The same confusion that exists in fellowships and in churches where there is no leader. The same confusion, the same scattering will take place where there is a leader, but is ruling with force and with cruelty. And then it says in verse 5, And they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. That means they will get into agreement or association with false prophets. They will get involved with false doctrine because there is no leader to actually help them. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth and none did search or seek after them. In Isaiah chapter 56, the danger when the leadership, when the shepherd is sinful, corrupt, or covetous. Isaiah chapter 56 and from verse 9. All ye beasts of the field, talking in a figurative sense, all ye beasts of the field, come to devour. Yea, all ye beasts in the forest, his watchmen are blind. And so they can't see when those wild animals are coming to destroy the people they should be watching over. Those watchmen are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs that cannot bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs. Which cannot have enough. All they complain about is not enough money. Not enough salary. Not enough allowance. And there is no equipment. And there is no car. And there is nothing that I'm going to use. I wish those pastors came to this conference so we could tell them, because I know that you are not like that. You know, if, if I could just have an opportunity to invite pastors that are like that, that are covetous and sinful, and we could just get them to this conference and be able to tell them directly that it is like there is no shepherd at all. You don't like to be like that. I don't like to be like that. That God will say, even though they have a person that says he's a shepherd, it's like he's dead. I don't reckon with him. He has no record in heaven that he's a minister of the gospel or he's a shepherd because he's blind. He can't see afar. Short-sighted. He's ignorant. He doesn't know the needs of the people. He doesn't see when they cry. He doesn't see where, when they're hungry. He doesn't see their needs to meet those needs. And they're all done. Think of a man, even ordinary man that is not a shepherd. Who is blind and ignorant and dumb at the same time. 
Why is he leaving? Now think of a pastor. Think of an overseer. Think of a person that ought to be a leader in the household of faith. Who is blind and dumb and ignorant, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Greedy. Can never have enough. Shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way. Everyone for his gain. For his quarter. It's like this uh, passage knew that Nigerians will become pastors before the, uh, the passage was written. Because unfortunately, this is a description of many people in Nigeria that say that they are doing Christian work. And everywhere that, you know, the people go, it looks like all that they're looking for is, I want to have more, I want to have more, I want to have more. They want to see if they can build an empire through what they can get through the church and through crusades and whatever it is. But then it says, they even say, come, come ye, say they, I will fetch wine and we will fill ourselves with strong drink and tomorrow shall be as this day and much more abundant. Shepherds, watchmen, leaders, and pastors, may God deliver us from that type of leadership. Amen. Now, number three, I told you, number one, there are situations and cases when it appears uh, there is no leader at all. In fact, the, the, the church or the group has nobody that they can relate to and say that is a pastor or that is the shepherd. Number two, I told you that sometimes the shepherd is there, but is sinful and corrupt and unclean, covetous. Number three, sometimes the shepherd is undeveloped. Immature and childish. Undeveloped. We listened in the morning to our minister from Plato State, Brother Alfred, when he was talking on the personal development program. You know, some of the things we hear. If we will take them to heart and we just say, Lord, I'm going to work on this and we work on it, I believe that it will help us tremendously. Now, I didn't have opportunity of going to Bible school. In fact, the secondary school I went, as many of you will know, the principal was and still is an atheist. All through my five years in secondary school, the principal did not allow us to have religious knowledge as one of the subjects. He said he wouldn't have it in the school. So none of us students took religious knowledge in secondary school. And I was born in the Anglican church. And uh, my father, all that my father wanted when we were growing, uh, growing up is that while we had the morning devotion uh, as an Anglican home, very, very strict Anglican home, all he wanted is for you to keep awake because my father loved the Bible so much that if he found us children dozing during that uh, morning devotion, you know, they will ring the bell uh, at 5.30 in the morning. And when I heard the sound of that bell, I felt it was the devil ringing that bell. <laughs> I mean, who, who is it in this world that will wake a child up at 5.30 when he, he just wants to enjoy sleep? I felt the devil has come again ringing that bell. And then we, we came together to have the devotion. And while we're having the devotion, if my father is dead now, but till the day of his death, he was a strong, active man. If he saw you dozing like this, he would leave the Bible and the hymn book and the prayer book and deal with you and beat you thoroughly. <laughs> After beating you thoroughly, then he'll come back and say, as I was saying. hated that Bible. I hated the prayer. And then we got into secondary school and there was, there was total liberty. That you didn't have to go to church. If you wanted to go to church, there was church far away in the town. You, should, you could go on your own. But not that you will study the Bible in class all through the five years. Now, I became born again. Just the year I was to enter the university. And it was that same year that I was born again, I entered university, and I was to study mathematics. Something that will take your whole time completely. But I saw my handicap. That when I was young, I knew nothing. I didn't know the difference between apostle and epistle. But what will I do now? 
there must be a personal development program. And I started. I didn't know that I'd be preaching like this. And in the church I belonged to before, I, we didn't do crusades. In, I never saw the church I belonged to before doing crusade. Never. Evangelism, never. The gifts of the Spirit, never. Now, and yet, when I became, I just saw myself, the Lord leading me. And we started 1973 with Deeper Christian Life Ministry. And I never gone to Bible school. And I didn't know all the things I ought to know. And yet, as we started, I needed to teach the Bible. I needed to pray for the people. And when people ask me questions, I cannot say, I don't know that. I didn't go to school. Nobody will want to know that for me. So I needed to study on my own. And now as the church was developing, I needed to train leaders. Now, you think of these uh, great people that are giving us some of the things they are saying. I have to listen very hard to even understand them. <laughs> and think of the possibility of my training these people. If, if I didn't have a personal development program, I could do nothing. So that means then that if, we, if we're really going to do something, and I was referring to the brother that preached in the morning, all those things that he said, we just apply ourselves to them. Now, why would you go back now to a Bible school? Already you are maybe general overseer. Already maybe you are pastor. Maybe you are bishop already. And there's a lot of work in your hand. You cannot go back to school again. Well, most of us cannot go back like that again. But even though you cannot go back again, I believe that it is still possible for every one of us to develop. And if you find that yourself, you are in the third category, undeveloped, immature, and childish, I was like that before. Now, some of you are listening to me before. I mean, uh, like five years ago, seven years ago, when you listen to me now, and then you find that somebody is sleeping. The way, the way I can wake up a sleeping person now is different from the way I wake him up five years ago. <laughs> five years ago, those of you listening to me, I'll say, ah, this is very important, and somebody is sleeping here. Brother, get up, wake up, you are sleeping. That's the way I'll do it five years ago. But today, I have a story to wake him up. So that means then that as leaders, we must not remain immature. We must not remain undeveloped. We must not remain childish. And um, if, uh, if you don't buy any cassette at all, the two cassettes this morning, you must, you know, buy them. The one on the personal development growth, um, development program, and the one on the cell group and the church growth, if you don't have any other, they want all the things I say, I make you laugh, you know, you can forget those cases. But I know you like the cases because we like to laugh again. <laughs> you know, you, you want to take these cases back home and just, you know, anytime you are sad, you remember that, well, I'm sad now, let me take the cases so that I can laugh. You know, buy those cases because of the laughter. But these cases that are very, very important, the ones that you just cannot do without, otherwise we might remain immature. We might remain childish. Now, what happens when the leader is childish, immature? In Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. And in verse 16. Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child. And thy princes eat in the morning. When the king, when the shepherd, when the leader is a child, childish. In verse 17, blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of the nobles. And thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. Then you will remember Solomon's son. When he started to reign and he became a shepherd, a king, over the people of Israel, the people came to him with Jeroboam and he said, your father made it so hard for us, but he is our burden. He said, go back and come back the third day. That's in 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 1 to 16. Just write it down. There's no time to read that now. And he said, go and come back three days time. I'll give you the answer. 
before they came back. He called the elderly people that were ministers, along with his own father Solomon. And he said, these people came to me and he said, what do you want me to answer these people? Oh, they said, tell them, as matured people, grown up people, wise people, dependable people. They said, tell them that you will be their servants. You'll make their burdens lighter. He said, you can go. Then he called the young, young people. These are the people I'm talking about, undeveloped, immature, and childish. He said, these fellows came to me and think about leading a nation. Not just a nation, leading a nation of the choice of God. Not just a nation of the choice of God, a nation that God wanted to use to make the knowledge of the only living God spread throughout the whole world. Think of a king like that. Over such people, what a great responsibility. Think of you as a pastor over a church. Think, yourself, think of yourself as a shepherd over a denomination and the responsibility that is in your hand. Do you realize what can be achieved in your denomination, in your church, if we could only have the right type of leaders? Think of a church, maybe all over in the church, in your own denomination, you have like the Anglican church, the record is that the Anglican membership alone in this country is beyond one million. Think if the shepherds and the leaders over those one million people, if they can just be the type that we have in the New Testament, they are enough to win the whole of the nation back to Christ. Think of the CAC, the record we have is that CAC is more than 400,000. 400,000 in the whole of this nation. If the leaders will be the New Testament type of leaders, they are enough. They have the students, they have the college, um, the college people, they have the graduates, they have the professionals, they have many of these people that they can just lead and direct in the right direction and they can win the nation to Christ. Church of God mission. The record is that there are more than 250,000 in this Nigeria alone. Think of if they could have just the biblical New Testament leadership in its fullness. I'm not saying they don't have. I'm talking of in its fullness. Now think of what they could do and make this nation to go back to God. And think of our own denominations where we have come from. Even if all together that you're a leader or you are a pastor in a church with just 50,000 people all together. 50,000 people. Jesus Christ did not have that number before he left. We are told that about 500 people saw him before he went to glory, after his resurrection. And out of the 500, only 120 waited in the upper room. In fact, if you only had 120 people that were saved, and that were willing to go all the way with God. I've told you of Anglican more than 1 million. I've told you of CAC more than 400,000. I've told you of Church of God Mission more than 250,000 all over Nigeria. Now, come away from even those big, 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 um, big churches and come to your church, just 120 people. And you made up your mind. And you said, all the leaders in this church, they'll be the New Testament caliber of leaders. Will get out of way for you and you can evangelize Nigeria. Because God can do a lot with people that are committed to Him, with people that will say, We read it in the New Testament and this is what we're going to do. And I don't know any church here, any church represented here, that the total membership of the whole, I'm not talking of just a single church, I'm talking of your denomination as a whole that you represent. I don't know anyone that is less than 120. Can't we find 120 adults, sincere people, that will tell them now, we're going back to New Testament style of leadership. If it takes praying, we're going to pray. If it takes consecration, we're going to consecrate. Anything it takes, we're going to pay the price, and God will use you mightily. So that's why we're here. That's why we're here to challenge ourselves that where the leadership has been undeveloped, immature, and childish, we will develop leadership. And we will develop ourselves and will develop the uh, people, the other people in our denomination. Now, let's come back to Rehoboam. That's what I was telling you. That this man, 
he should have known that he was a leader over such a great nation. But then, he asked the young people, what do you think I should say to these people who are asking me? Oh, and he said, you tell them that the hardship they saw at the time of your father Solomon, that's a small thing. That I, he whipped you with ordinary whip, I will whip you with scorpions. See how childish. See how immature. And then these people came back the third day. And he said, what do you have to say? And he said what he had to say. And he broke the kingdom on his head. Isn't that how some ministries are broken on our heads? Some churches are broken on our heads because of immaturity in the leadership. There must be maturity. Now the fourth level of maturity. I've talked of no shepherd at all. I've talked of sinful, corrupt, um, covetous uh, leadership. I've talked of undeveloped, immature, childish leaders. Now matured, growing shepherd leaders. Matured, yet still growing. Matured, yet still growing. Now, before I go on, let me explain what that means to you. Sometimes uh, we feel that, like the brother said in the morning, that we have not got to a particular stage. We are matured enough, and there is no possibility of growth anymore. I'm still growing. In fact, sometimes uh, some of our leaders here, they know. I mean, some of these people who are preaching. Sometimes I went to Calabar, and I was uh, with this uh, brother Augustine Odi. Uh, I call him brother, they call him pastor. Now, because he's, uh, he's been my student and been the person that God has helped me to train, I just call him brother. But his people in the whole state, they just call him pastor and overseer. And so they give him some names. I, I can't remember everything now. Now, I got to Calabar and I was uh, to have a miracle service. I went there to minister. But he was kind enough to accommodate me in his own personal room where he has all his books. And uh, in the night, after we came back from the meeting, then I looked at all those books. I saw the ones I didn't have. And then I called him. I said, uh, brother, I know that I know a lot and I know almost everything. But can I take this book away from your shelf and read it? <laughs> and the books are even still with me that I have not returned unto him. I was, uh, I saw one, uh, the brother who was in Plato State before, Brother Matari. I call him brother because he was my student even in secondary school. So in mathematics, he was my student in the scriptures. He's been my student, but he's now an overseer. So I still call him brother, but they call him overseer. Now, and I, I saw him, and then I saw a book with him. I said, uh, brother, don't be reading this thing privately. Old men too, they need young people's materials. <laughs> and I got uh, something from him. I was in Kano. I went to visit our church there with uh, Brother Ransom. He was a student at the University of Lagos when I was lecturing there. But now I call him brother, but he has a church of more than 4,000 people in Kano. So uh, even when people hear me calling him a brother, if they don't know me, they say, it's our pastor you are calling him brother like that. <laughs> but um, by the grace of God, God, God is helping him. And I saw a book in his hand. And that book on the gifts of spirit and, and uh, the charismatic uh, gifts. And I said, uh, brother, let me take this away. Would you mind? Oh, he said, uh, I said, by the way, this is not the only book you have. Can I see your shell? Because he cleared the room where he put me. He wanted the room to be empty. And he wanted the room to be neat. And he packed all the good books out of the house. <laughs> and, I, and I got to his shelf. And I picked all the books I wanted. I said I never saw this. So this is what you are reading, you young people. <laughs> so I got, I got all those books from him. And I came to Lagos. And I got some messages out of the books. And when I preached in Lagos, they said, our pastor is always like that. <laughs> But the people in Lagos will not know that 
I depend upon some of our leaders, and some of our leaders, whenever they see some good books and materials, they say, uh, they don't want to say, uh, brother, you need to develop because they want to respect me. They say, brother, uh, we know you know all things, but look at this. Maybe, maybe there is a new thing there. Well, we know you know it already, but uh, see it if it will be beneficial. They are just trying to be humble. They know that this man, if we don't help him like that, he'll become stale. Therefore, they give those things to me. I read them, and I enjoy them. That's how to develop. But if we say, I'm matured already, there's no point for growth. How are we going to grow? Therefore, the first section is not just that we are matured leaders. We are matured, but we're still growing leaders and shepherds. Now, I've told you all these things. It's easy for me to just run you through the Bible and quote this and quote that and not give you examples of myself. But if you know how, by the grace of God, the little we are doing, how we are doing it, how we are growing, how we are getting the work done, then you'll be able to put these little, little things together. And by the grace of God, what God has done with us, he will do with you. Amen. And why can't he do more if he's no respecter of persons? Depending on how we yield ourselves to the Lord. So, number four, matured, growing shepherds and leaders. Let me just give you one example. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, and from verse 14, And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah saw that he behaved himself very wisely, and he was uh, sorry, all Judah and Is all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. That's David. He was matured, even though at a young age, and yet he was still growing. Now, there's a lot of implications on all these things that I'm telling you. The implications are this. Determine that as a pastor yourself, as a leader yourself, as a shepherd yourself, you must grow and you must develop. Then plan for it. Prepare for it. Then also expose your leaders and pastors to what we call growth possibilities. Growth possibilities. Now do you know that in 1985, all our state overseers, they were sent to Korea because right now, the, Korea, the church in Korea, a single church, there are more than 500,000. At that time, I think there were just about 400,000. And we were going to have the cell group system that you heard about this morning. And I knew that in Young Church's church, that he had already raised up this church and he had brought out the principles of cell groups. And we started the house fellowship system. And we had been doing it and doing it, and by the grace of God, it was successful. And I think that I had read almost anything you could lay your hand upon on the house fellowship system. I had read almost everything. And we had planned everything. We were working on it in the whole nation, on deeper life, and it was working. But I decided that all our state overseers were together with about 17 of our leaders in Lagos, with 18 state overseers, making 35, that they must go to Korea and learn about just this house fellowship. I didn't feel I wanted to go with them because I'd had my own opportunity. I read, I study, and I'm exposed. More than all of them are exposed. And I could go alone by myself and then come and tell them what I saw. But how will they understand? And I wanted the church to grow. And I knew that they are deeper life. They won't go to Korea and come back and say they are no more deeper life. All they are going for is training. And they went. And then they came back. Of course, the amount of money we spent, even for the flight alone, because Korea is not, uh, Korea is not like Ghana. You will, you will be in the aeroplane. If you had wanted to really ride, uh, fly in an aeroplane, and you are excited. When you get to an aeroplane and you are going to Korea, you'll be saying, why did I decide to go? It will, you'll sit down and say, it's so long. But they got there. 
and he saw everything that was going on there. Then he came back to Nigeria. Since I was born, I've never been in Korea. All our leaders, they have gone. But it doesn't bother me. I want the church to grow. And whatever will help the church to grow, let's all do it. Let's all make it available. And here we are in a church growth now by the grace of God when we learn something and then we go through the Bible. So if I didn't tell you, you will not know that we even learned anything from Korea. You'll think, oh, deeper life people, they are always, they just dig it out on their own. I listened to this brother this morning on cell groups and I was telling, um, I was saying, who was I talking to? I was telling brother Augustine Odi, I said that, look at uh, this uh, pastor that we sent to Korea that is doing more than Korea. <laughs> because I've listened to uh, the cassettes that they listened to when they went to Korea on house fellowship. In fact, listening to that cassette, I don't think I will find only a single page to even write down. And these people came back from Korea and they developed the house fellowship that they are preaching and you write eight pages, you write ten pages. That's how it is. But that's because we're exposing them. We're exposing them. But if we just hear all this, and we do not expose our pastors and leaders. I don't know where we're going from here, but uh, we're still going to have some time for questions. Where you will ask, uh, you know, all the type of questions you want to ask. And maybe we'll still have another conference similar to this. <laughs> and some people who should be here who are not here now will get back home and say, You are in Nigeria? Ah, you have missed something. Even if it is all the stories that we had that we are going to use in our churches and make our people to laugh, even if it is that alone, you miss something. Yeah. You know, the story about that sleeping man that just rose up. <laughs> even if that is all that we got, I think the fellowship is wonderful. Now, we should expose the leaders. We should expose the pastors because they need to grow. And you must determine that yourself. You will grow and you will develop. And you must be prepared to expose your leaders and your pastors and fellow ministers. There are ministers that are in other, other um, denominations, but they are your friends. Don't say, well, I will not tell them of what we got so that they will not grow above us. What if they grow above us? What does it matter? The people that taught me salvation, sanctification, Holy Ghost, baptism, the apostolic faith, now I've understood evangelism more than they do. But you know what I believe? The work that God is doing through deeper life, when we are going to receive reward, some of my teachers that are over there will receive part of the reward of what God has done through me. Because without them, I couldn't have even started at all. And what does it matter if other people that we bring in, other people that we introduce to, maybe you buy some of these cases and somebody didn't come and you say, brother, listen to this. It will help your church. Well, if their churches, if they grow more than our churches grow, when they are receiving reward, we will receive part of the reward because we were instrumental to their growth. Now, if we... If we thought now deeper life is growing and we like to keep growing and we still, we still are keep going to keep on growing. And if I thought now, if I go call all these uh, state overseers and all these things will make, will make them available to all these churches. Suppose they start growing. Suppose they start growing. God will be happy. And if I'm unhappy and God is happy, good luck. If you're a child of God, whatever makes God happy must make you happy. And if you grow, it will be our joy. If you grow, that is the will of God. And that is why, you see, if, if you are in a deeper life, um, deeper life minister's conference, pastor's conference, all that we're sharing now is the same thing we would have shared. Nothing less. And we're putting everything across so that by the grace of God, the same power will work in you. Amen. The same spirit will work in every one of us. And we must expose other ministers and other pastors to growth possibilities. 
And then we have learned something, that when there is no leader, there is a lot of problem. Therefore, don't remove your workers and pastors just for any flimsy reason and excuse. Sometimes we are too hard on our pastors. Now you know that we are strict, at least I am strict, but even then, I know that when there is no leadership, the church will scatter. And as strict as I could be, I know that there must be leaders over the churches. And then another thing is, I see how to train and develop more leaders. Now, what are the things we will do? I'll just give you now in just about five minutes, the things we will do. I could have spent one hour on what I'm going to give you now, but I won't spend one hour because there's somebody that is coming to preach now after I have, you know, I'm just here to make you happy and my own is not a note matter. After this session, you have note matter. <laughs> do we understand that? Yeah. So I will soon round up. Now, what are we going to do? Number one, we must preach. We must preach. That's your priority. Positive preaching. Pungent preaching. Powerful preaching. Pentecostal preaching. Practical preaching. Then you must teach. Then you must pray. Pray for the church. Pray for the work. Pray for individuals. Many, many references. That Paul the Apostle said, since I heard of your faith, I have not ceased praying for you. Then you must counsel. You must give time as a minister, as a shepherd, and as a pastor. You must give quality time that you're, you're just listening to the problems, the confusions, the complaints of the people. And you will counsel. When they are confused, you will counsel. When they are getting prepared for marriage, you will counsel. When they have some unsolvable problems, so to say, in their lives, you must counsel. You preach, you teach, you pray, you counsel. You must love. Love. Uh, you know, sometimes love can heal a hurt. Love can make an unstable member to become stable. Love can make an, a person you couldn't depend upon before. Love can make him more dependable. Oh yes, you must love and love and love. Love them to, be, to the point that they are embarrassed. And they say, I'm not qualified for this. The more we love, the less we criticize. The more we love, the, more, the less we will have complaints of the people. Now... Do you know that sometimes your own wife is a member of your church as well as your wife and the mother of your children? And sometimes she is the person that gets the least attention in all the members of the church. And uh, the, the wife says, my husband, I have this problem. I'm busy. You know that I'm a pastor before you married me. But she's a member of the church and she needs counseling. <laughs> and she cannot go to another member of the church and the pastor's wife seeking counseling and advice from members of the church or from elders or even other pastors. Not to expose your family. Give her time. And at other times, uh, you know, the woman will come around and uh, while the wife is talking, you are looking at the wristwatch. And then she says, but you've been away for so long. And here am I, and I just need a little time. And you're looking at the watch. I won't have the freedom to say everything I have to say. Please, you must uh, hurry up and say whatever you want to say. You know that I'm busy. Evangelism is there. Preaching is there. Counseling is there. And all that is there. But, brother, pastor, you spend one hour counseling outsider. And this is a member of the church. And she has equal right with all the other people to also receive counseling. You spend one hour with another person just counseling and praying, just listening, and said, is that your problem? And the problem she's talking about is similar to the problem of your wife. When it is the other person that is seeking the counseling, oh yes, my sister, this is how you must do it, this is how you must do it, this is how you must do it. And then you pray for her. And then even you fast on her behalf. Then your wife comes. I say, this is what I'm telling you. You are not growing. That's why I cannot make use of you in the church. 
All these other people that came yesterday, they are growing more than you are. That's why you are still sitting. Anyway, I'm going to heaven. Anywhere you like to go, I leave you behind. <laughs> but you don't do like that to the other members of the church. Love every member of the church with your wife included. Am I right? Yes. We preach, we teach, we pray, we counsel, we love. Number six, we care. That's a ministry. The ministry of caring. Oh yes, we just care. And Paul the Apostle said, the burden that is upon me every time, the care of the churches. Then we train the workers. Train the workers. In training the workers, we equip them. Then we delegate work into their hands. Then we release them for the service that is dedicated into their hands. Then we supervise what we have released them to do. Then we control what we are supervising. You train the workers. In training them, you equip them. You qualify them. You give them all the things that they need that will make them successful in the work on the job that is committed into their hands. Then, after equipping them, delegate work into their hands. Give them responsibility. Now you see in our uh, church here, the church so large. And many areas of the job. But do you, do you understand that when our church was smaller, I was leaner than this one? You remember? Because even though the work was small, I counseled, I preached, I did everything until sometimes I will not forget that there is something they call food. And if I still continue doing like that now, well, God will bless me. But then I will go to heaven faster than I should go. <laughs> so delegate work. Divide the work and give some part of the work that doesn't need your attention. Give it to these leaders and shepherds and pastors that you are training. You equip them, you delegate them. But after delegating the work, you release them to do it. You don't, uh, you know, just say it on them. Even though you have delegated the work that they should do it, you are not allowing them to do it. Allow them to do it. Release them to do it. And then while you release them to do it, that doesn't set you free. That now I've released them, they're doing it, I have no job again. Supervise. Supervise. And as you are supervising, you'll be correcting, you'll be encouraging, you'll be appreciating them, and you'll be telling them how to do it better. That's the control. You equip, you delegate, you release, you supervise, you control. So then, we preach, we teach, we pray, we counsel, we love, we care, we train, we lead. You must be a leader in all aspects. In the life, show the example. In resourcefulness, show the example. In the ability to work, show the example. Now, you know, if I called all our state overseers together and I was teaching them how the church will grow, and then the church where I am pastor at the headquarters, the thing is not growing, and I'm only giving them theory, they won't believe me. But they know that I teach them. I tell them on how to handle a crusade, and I'm able to give them example of how to handle a crusade. I teach them on how to pray for the sake. I'm able to handle it, how to pray for the sake. I teach them what the pastor's ministry should be, and they see that I can be a pastor. Even when I'm teaching, if I come to teaching what an evangelist says, they know I can handle a crusade all alone, by myself, as an evangelist. I tell them of the gifts of the Spirit, and I tell them that this is how it works, tell them the history, tell them the whole thing, and then they see it in manifestation. Be an example. I tell them one man, one wife, and they see it. I tell them that you must be accountable for the funds in the church and the siege. I tell them that now any work that is doing, only the best is good for God. Aim for excellence. Don't have something that, well, you'll say, well, let's give that to God. I tell them, aim for excellence. Now, you know that uh, for many, many years that we were not wearing, um, you know, coat and tie. You remember? Now, but... Actually, when I saw that some people were taking it to the other extreme, and that all that we're saying is not that the court was a sin, 
but that it is not every time in hot Nigeria that you put on a suit, but he misunderstood everything. Then I came around and I said, now this is it. But let me tell you, when I told them that they should wear coats, then they sold coats that were good looking and nice. Not just, not just wear something. And you see these ministers that, you know, come up here. You wonder, ah, these people that were not wearing this thing before, they wear it now better than those of us who were wearing it before. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Now, you see, aim for excellence in everything that you do. You're building your church. Look at the style in that church at, at, in this, at the center, at Bagada. Aim for excellence. Look at what is going on here. And it is just develop anything you are doing for the master, anything you are doing for the king in your church, in your preaching. Look at the style of preaching of these, our, you know, young, young, growing uh, ministers. The way they'll just go through this, 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 as if they studied communication and hermeneutics. But that's because we're aiming for excellence. Uh, do we understand? Yes. And so let us aim for excellence and make sure that we are actually leading. You are, lead, you are a leader in character. You are a leader in life. You are a leader in ministration. You are a leader in church, in everything that is being done. And you're always developing yourself to really lead. And then watch. That's your ministry. Watch and protect the congregation from evil. And then lastly, plan, develop strategies, set goals, for each area of the world. Plan. You're going to have a church retreat. Let a lot of planning go into it. You're going to have a crusade. Let a lot of planning go into it. Or you want to reorganize in your church. Don't just wake up one morning and say, we're going to start our fellowship system. You have heard it in the morning. But don't just wake up and say, now I get home. And the very first Sunday I get home, we're going to start cell groups. No, take time to plan. He who fails to plan is planning to fail. Did you hear that? Yeah. If we fail to plan, we are planning to fail. So plan. Develop strategies. Set goals for each area of the world. If we do all this, we'll be showing God that we really mean business. We want to be who God wants us to be. And I believe that God himself will give us all the help required from heaven. Amen. None of us can do all these things on our own. In 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 5. Not that we're sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. All these things we're hearing in this conference, God will help us. Amen. Our sufficiency is of God. He will do it. Amen. If he can do it through some people outside Nigeria and in Nigeria, he will do it through every one of us. Amen. If we feel weak today, we'll be strong tomorrow. Amen. If we feel ignorant today, we'll be knowledgeable tomorrow. Amen. If we feel that we have failed in the past, let us forget the past and press forward to the price of our high calling. God himself will do everything that needs to be done, and he will use us. And by the time we get home to glory, he will look at us and say, well done. Thou good and faithful servant, what things were committed in your hand, you have done faithfully, successfully, and you have received, and you have been victorious in need, and then you will have reward. Every one of us will have a reward. Let's rise up and pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's close our eyes for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we so thank you very much this afternoon. For all these things we are hearing, and all these things we are seeing in demonstration, these are things that people outside this country, some people leave Nigeria and they travel abroad, but adventure, they could hear some of these things. But these things are just at our doorstep. Father in heaven, we thank you very much opening our ears and our eyes to this secret of growth and the secret of success in the ministry of Shepherd. Father, we are praying that all that we have had, you will give us the grace to carry them out in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we know that in the past, you expected these things of us, 
but you've not been able to measure up to what you required. But Lord, we are here as students to learn and that we might go back home and then educate our people, put them into practice. Heavenly Father, we pray that all these things that we are hearing, they will become practicable in our lives, in our churches, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Anything that will likely hinder us, anything that will likely be opposition to these things, Father, remove them in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, we so thank you. We know that it's a great work to be a shepherd over the people of God. It's a great work. We need your wisdom. We need your knowledge. We need your grace. We need understanding. We need your anointing. Lord, all these things that will make us to be effective and successful shepherds, Lord, give it to us in Jesus' name. Amen. We so thank you very much. And we pray that your servant that you've been using to minister to us, you will refill him the more in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Um, I'm so excited today because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. I just thank God, third year, the same thing. And I thank God because I'll be graduating in May. I didn't have 